curbs. What's their purpose? Why do some drivers avoid them, whilst others attack every single one in sight? And most importantly, how can you use them to go faster? Back in the day, racetracks didn't have curbs, and track limits were merely enforced by lush green lawns. As you can imagine, when driving one of these rickety rockets well above 150 miles per hour and battling your rival whilst also trying not to fucking die, knowing where the tarmac ends and the grass starts was tricky. Not only was it hard visually, but once you dip a tyre onto the green stuff, it effectively becomes ice, especially on old crossfly tyres, and this resulted in a few minor incidents. The simple solution was to add rumble strips to the perimeter of racetracks much like you see on highways today. This feedback through the wheel, paired with the awful sound, warns drivers to get the hell back on the track. These rumble strips, paired with little ramps put on street circuits to make road curbs less dangerous, evolved into the circuit curbs we know today. These new curbs have two primary functions to let drivers know of the track limits and then to enforce them. This is why we see some curbs that are literally just painted on the ground. They're only there to warn the driver that the track ends. Despite their unassuming appearance, however, these things can be more dangerous than any other kind of curb in we'll be covering today. Even in totally dry conditions, they can be as slippery as a used car's warranty. The most common type is the rumble curb, essentially serving the same purpose, but with a more severe warning that the track ends. Often raised off the ground, with slightly less grip than tarmac, and a rumble through the steering wheel. I don't have a slightly funny simile for this one. Then there's also the devil spawn. That being sausage curbs and whatever these bloody monstrosities are on the Nordschleife. These curbs are placed here simply to deter you from cutting a corner and in turn getting dirt all over the track. Or you know, to send cars into outer space. Not good. So why do some drivers use these curbs whilst others avoid them? Is there a secret to be learned here? The obvious answer that you're probably expecting is you need to get onto the curbs quite a lot if you want to use all of the track. But spoiler alert, this is not the subject of this video. I'm just covering my bases. Curbs are usually placed on the racing line, meaning the track is essentially expanded by the width of the curb, allowing you to open the corners up even more. If you've ever watched touring cars, you'll notice just how aggressive they are on the old curbing, often cutting it as much off the corner as possible, which results in moments like this. Taking curbs in this fashion is usually faster if done in a straightish line, because you're cutting down the distance you have to travel, like a sprint runner that is on the inside lane, and this is especially useful for doing some classic, boisterous touring overtakes. However, if done whilst turning too much, it'll end up looking like this instead. But there's a reason why you only see this in touring cars. They're hardy, almost bulletproof machines, bred for quick bursts of violent racing, these cars are some of the only automobiles that can withstand ramping themselves over these curbs. Which is the exact reason I picked this, the Hyundai Elantra, for my Assetto Corsa Sim Racing League. Starting today for the next six weeks, we'll be doing racing like this every Sunday. This front wheel driven, touring monster is one of the easiest race cars I've ever driven, and it should make some extremely fun racing. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or a novice, anyone is welcome. Our first race will be on the 25th of June and practice starts today. So make sure you join my Discord and come race with us. And you never know, you might just end up in a video or two. Anyway, back to launching cars over curbs. One of my favourite examples is in GT3 cars at Monza, specifically at the second Lesmo. Yes, I know GT3 and touring cars are not the same, but it works in this situation. You need to get on the brakes as late as your puny human reaction times will let you, and trail them into the turn, in order to rotate the rear of the car around so you can effectively bounce your front right tyre off the curbing, which gives you an optimum exit onto the straight. If this was tried in a car that relies more on downforce, such as a formula car, it's going to bottom out the aero, even if it can manage to mount the curbing without ripping the entire front end off. But no, whilst extending the track and cutting curbs is a way you can use curbs to go faster, this is not the purpose of this video. 
Ignoring racing lines, great drivers actually use kerbs to drive the car itself faster. There are a couple of examples of this, each increasing in coolness. The first and least cool example of this is one I discovered myself. This is turn 5 at Watkins Glen. A long, sweeping corner with subtle camber. It requires a steady hand and foot as you balance the car on a knife's edge, trying to get as much rotation as possible whilst not losing the rear end. It's a real challenge to do so, but there is a quick and dirty trick you can use to gain more rotation and get through the corner faster. Due to slip angle, the car isn't travelling totally straight, meaning the front inside wheel is closer to the inside of the turn than the rear. If you dip just the front tyre onto the kerb, it will in turn have less traction, and like a tank, the outside will want to travel faster than the inside, further rotating the car around the turn, allowing you to stay on the throttle longer and use less steering input, which means less friction slowing you down. This only works if you're on the very limit of grip and you have a big slip angle. If you're not pushing the car as hard as possible, you'll end up putting both wheels on the kerb and losing grip entirely. It's a risky manoeuvre, but if you want to set as fast times as possible, it's absolutely necessary. The second example is one I shamelessly stole from F1's Martin Brundle at this week's Monaco Grand Prix. This is a Nouvelle Chicane, and is succeeded by a decently long straight, so it's imperative that you get a good launch out of it, because as you know, you'll gain the most time on the straights. However, the exit is extremely narrow. You can't exit wide here, unless you want to end up in the harbour. However, this chicane does have a nice bit of curbing, Literally every single car on the F1 grid will use this kerb to gain as much speed as possible, and it's quite frankly amazing how they do it. As they enter the chicane, they aim to cut off as much of that kerb as possible with the front inside tyre. Not only does this improve the racing line, but more importantly, it chucks the front wheel up into the air. Typically, this would be a bad thing. Less wheel means less traction. However, as they're attacking the kerb, they're also turning into the chicane and blipping the throttle. This instantaneous massive shift in weight, paired with the steering and sharp throttle input, makes the rear of the car skip around the corner. In turn, this lines the car up with the exit much faster, as compared to taking it normally, which then allows them to get a faster drive onto the straight. It's these minute techniques that are overlooked by the casual spectator, which makes F1 drivers the greatest in the world and they do this on almost every single lap with laser precision. You can't do anything but watch in awe, even if the racing isn't that exciting. But what is exciting, however, is this video in which I tell you how these greatest drivers in the world steer the car using their pedals.